are, does it have any connection to the boomerang style? I don't know enough about the different types of stealth, yeah. but it would be a, definitely, from what I've been told, a stealth airplane. One mm -hmm. of these was a local, uh, one of them was a friend of mine who happens to be a clairvoyant, Maria Fix. Other lady, uh, and she was with another person uh, who saw this. Mm -hmm. the, uh, another townsperson, Carol Brady, uh, out there, she's a real estate agent in, in Montauk, she saw a stealth airplane. Um, I was not surprised uh, at all. She also uh, has three boys who are blue-eyed and blonde hair, and she was very well aware that they were kidnapping people who were blue-eyed and blonde hair as late as, I think, 88. Mm -hmm. And uh, th she said the police were involved, they knew about this, and uh, so this is a, another substantiation of Preston's story from a totally independent source. There's also uh, Preston, after the book was written, he proceeded to introduced me to different people who have had various involvements in one way or another. One of the more interesting was a, a man who had uh, worked as a contractor in the underground at Montauk in the 70s. Mm -hmm. He went down there and serviced the Amplitrons. He saw, I think, 20 or oh. tw 24 Amplitrons underground, mm -hmm. and he serviced them. He's a, a nuclear physicist, and he said there's no reason on Earth you would want Amplitrons down there to amplify uh, sage radar signals or transmissions, there's no reason for it mm -hmm. uh, unless they're doing something awfully strange or unusual. So, so that's a, a very interesting piece of information. Also, his, his assistant said that he had seen an antenna that had been serviced. This was in, I think, 1990 or thereabouts. An uh, antenna in the transmitter building that was actually clean and serviced with a tag. Mm -hmm. um, there was also the, the woman, the real estate agent told me that she'd seen, she said they were using that SAGE radar uh, out there, and because she, she would see the uh, big reflector moving. Mm -hmm. Now, Preston said there's no way that reflector could move. On further investigation, uh, this physicist's assistant said that this, there is a hand crank, and it was recently greased, mm -hmm. so that you can actually, because uh, the, the, yeah, the motor is mm -hmm. dead to the reflector, oh, but you can actually manually. Hand, mm -hmm. manually hand crank this radar reflector. So she, she was uh, quite satisfied that that thing had been being used. Mm -hmm. Now, well, the motors are actually missing. Oh, yeah. The cranks that oh. ran the reflector. Right. And there's, there's all other stories. Uh, one of the, the local historian out there had told me of an uh, instance of him going to the base and seeing, uh, he, and this is in 72, he mm -hmm. brought a friend of his back from lunch to the base where it was heavily patrolled with uh, people with, you know, soldiers with guns and one of the soldiers put a gun as they drove up to the inner gate right on his three-year-old son. Mm -hmm. He told him to remove it from his son, and then he pointed it right at, at him. Mm -hmm. This is a, you know, highly irregular behavior for a, what was considered in a federal aviation or at the FAA radar facility. Mm -hmm. so, so there are many stories that would definitely corroborate that there was a secret mm -hmm. uh, project of a highly secure nature and highly debatable nature as, as to whether it had any validity. And perhaps uh, we had shown you some pictures earlier of the uh, uh, programming room on the base. Now the mm -hmm. programming room, uh, what this was, is we just recently uh, discovered this. This is a room with, uh, one is a psychedelic room with graffiti looking stuff that's painted in a pattern by an artist. Mm -hmm. Another one is a black and white room. Another one is a paisley room, and then there's a leopard-striped room, which uh, reminds reminds us of the Timothy Leary experiments in the 60s. This could have been going on in the 60s. Um, so this is like uh, very hard evidence that something of an irregular nature was going on at the base. Mm -hmm. And as I'm saying, uh, we've also had uh, Helga Morrow contact us. Helga is a, is a woman whose father was involved in the Philadelphia and Montauk projects. Helga, uh, her father, his name was Frederick Cuppers. She has uh, evidence that her father did not die in, I think it was 62, like uh, was believed, because the hair on his hands was inconsistent with the man's in the coffin. And um, she was surrounded by trench-coated men at the time as well. So she, she uh, came here and visited us, and there was a lot of interesting collaboration with her mm -hmm. and uh, Preston and Duncan. But uh, and she can go on ad infinitum about this. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, you know, my main, basically what I have to say is there's, there's a lot to what's backing up 
their story. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not we can prove the time is that's difficult, mm -hmm. but that will come hopefully in time. It's just like so. That's basically why I'm here is to add some credibility to what they're saying, not mm -hmm. to swallow their story, but to uh, there's something here that warrants investigation and mm -hmm. further investigation, and that's what my role is in, uh, as I say, writing the first book, we're working on a second book, and also mm -hmm. publishing a newsletter to further inform people on what we are finding. And I think we're going to be um, very, very, we're going to have a lot more stuff coming, I can guarantee mm -hmm. you that. Essentially, what they would do is they would go out into the public. They first look for street wives. They were interested mainly in blonde, blue-eyed boys. They centered on the ages of maybe 10 to 16, 17. Although, as Duncan pointed out, they went a lot younger, a lot older. Mm -hmm. And what they were doing with these boys, outside the research end of it, well, they had multiple, multiple parts of the, <coughs> of the project. They would take these boys and they would essentially indoctrinate them mm -hmm. and they would whip them to within an inch of their life. Mm -hmm. Bestiality, brutality. The idea was they wanted to break the mind. When the mind was broken at that extreme point of fear, there were two things they were interested in. There had to be an alien connection into this because there's reports of some sort of technological device that would gather the patterns of fear. Hmm. There's also reports that there were some hormones removed from the bodies hmm. after the height of fear point. Secondly, they would electromagnetically capture the mind patterns that were released from the body. Hmm. They were stored in a big computer system. Hmm. They would manipulate and redesign the mind, literally redesign it. Then they would use the transmitter and put that mind, that new mind, back into the body through a human psychic adept, would like reinstall it through hmm. psychosexual means. Now, the reason they picked Duncan for this is he's blonde, blue-eyed, the whole nine yards of it. Mm -hmm. So they had to pick blonde, blue-eyed people because part of Duncan's mind would become part of the boy's mind. It means mm -hmm. the boy would have a third his original mind, a third of his mind would be computer-oriented, and the other third would be based upon the, the personality, consciousness of the transmitter system, Duncan, and anyone else that had an input to it. Mm -hmm. And they would uh, want to pick the mind, so two-thirds of the mind, or, you know, maybe a third to two-thirds of the mind would still be compatible with the body. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea is, if you take your mind out of your body, you would have to, in order to have it inhabit properly and not be sickly, physically sickly, you'd have to put that mind back in a genetically similar body. Mm -hmm. This is what they were looking for was the mind that would be added from the reinsert programmer, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call them, would have to be compatible with the body. Mm -hmm. So they'd have to pick kids of the same body type of the people they were programming. We believe they had mm -hmm. Italians, we believe they had Irish, and they had blonde, blue-eyed types. Mm -hmm. You know, Irish, Anglo-Saxon, and then blonde, blue-eyed types mm -hmm. for what they were doing. Now, these kids, once they were processed, the ones that lived and survived, we have information from deprogramming two boys that essentially they would be sent into special government projects, into genetic research, they would be put back in with their families, or they would be sent off as workers. You know, they could configure the mind to be the perfect worker, mm -hmm. for instance. This is what we know of the Montauk Boy Project. Mm -hmm. We know the big long bunker just north of the Radar Hill was where they did the work because we've deprogrammed three Montauk boys and they all remember that bunker. Mm -hmm. In fact, they almost go into fright when they see pictures of it. But they don't go into that degree of fright when they see the overall uh, mm -hmm. base itself. You know, as their main memories is in that bunker. Mm -hmm. They describe that room that has a three-sided room and then two sides this way. Mm -hmm. 
they describe a balcony. All this, this is all three in common, describe a balcony. You can see today there were big hooks that a balcony was hung on. Mm -hmm. So we have located the area. Now we've had a number of sensitives, including how they're in there, do a read on it, and they can feel the horror and the fright and all this that was done in there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and Duncan broke down in one of the bunkers and was essentially trying, I guess, to repent or saying he's sorry, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have reason to believe that we've located the area they did this in. Mm -hmm. That, in a nutshell, is what the Boys Project was about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. How long did that last? Between what periods do you? Well, we figure it started probably in the 60s out at Montauk. Mm -hmm. And probably it wasn't as advanced until they got the mind control project going. Yeah. Where they could so do that was an aspect of a, maybe a larger project? Yeah. Yeah. And, and we believe, believe it's still going on. And it's still going on, yet. Yeah. Somewhere else? No, in Montauk. Oh, yeah? In the underground. The same type of mo control? Manipulation? Well, we, we've Mental heard rumors of kidnapping still being done as late as 88. If they're working in 88, they're probably still working. Yeah. That's like only five years ago. Hmm. Hmm. So there is evidence of activity there right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah th there's also a connection to the uh, programming of the uh, boys with the uh, maybe some of the twin research of on twins that was done in the uh, Nazi regime. Mm -hmm. I don't personally have a lot of information on that, but that's uh, there's a, there's a lot of research on twins, psychosexual research on twins, mm -hmm. uh, psychic research that I believe was conducted by uh, Dr. Mengele. Uh, mm -hmm. The Nazi. Mengele, you mean? Mm -hmm. What? Mengele. Mengele. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if you have any more information, but there is a connection between that and the. Uh, the the blue eyed the blonde hairs of the Nazis oh, and also right. the uh, Pleiadians there's a legend to the, with the Pleiadians and the blue eyes and the blonde hair and there's, yeah, there's, right. a, there's a connection there as well but yeah. I'm, I'm not prepared to elaborate on that myself yeah, yeah as with some of the um, uh, Montauk was just hoarded with German scientists uh, this is something that my father was involved in before World War II during and then after is bringing some of these German scientists over mm -hmm. 